Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's 2015 and other reasons for gender transformative health promotion programming for girls. My name is Simone Vigier, and I'm a programs coordinator here at Girls Action Foundation. In a couple of minutes, I'll be passing the mic to Nancy Poole from the BC Center of Excellence for Women's Health. We are very fortunate to have her with us today. And I'm happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. Uh, for those returning, welcome back. And for those who are new to our webinar series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things along to Nancy. All right, very quickly, Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that believes in the power of girls as agents for social change. Through our network of organizations across Canada, we lead, develop, and implement transformative programs that are adapted and relevant to the changing realities of girls' and young women's lives. We also provide leadership trainings on a national scale, organize networking events, and do other activities that connect girls and young women. Today's webinar is part of our Girls Health and Wellness Project. Through this national project, Girls Action is developing health promotion programming for girls with partners from different communities across Canada and providing training and coaching to organizations from all sectors on best practices in girls' health promotion. Girls Action works with a national advisory committee of multiple partners with expertise in health research, youth programs, women's health, body image, and physical activity. The BC Center of Excellence for Women's Health is part of the advisory committee and is a project partner. Just before passing the mic to Nancy, I'd like to walk you through the interactive side of today's webinar. You'll see on your screen a number of different information displays and panels that will be changing throughout the presentation. On the right hand of the screen, you'll see a panel titled Q&A. Here is where you can ask questions and interact with Nancy, myself, and other participants. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, type it into the Q&A box, hit enter, and it will be recorded there. By default, the question will be visible to everyone. If you would prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box and select Girls Action instead of All Participants. The question will then come only to me. During Nancy's presentation, she'll be answering questions from the Q&A box. So feel free to ask your questions as they come. She will answer them at different moments of her presentation. I also wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, including the question period. This will be posted online and we'll send everyone a link to the recording. Finally, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up. Please fill it out. We'd love to hear your feedback. With that covered, we'd, I'd like to pass the ball to Nancy. Hi there. So um, I've entitled this uh, presentation, it's 2015 and other reasons for gender transformative health promotion um, programming for girls. And uh, I'm making that joke about it because it's 2015 because it was what um, Prime Minister Trudeau said as the media asked him about why it was important to have a cabinet that's gender balanced. And I just really appreciated that he started off by just not going into the weeds and giving a million explanations, but just being clear that we need to move on gender issues um, in this in this day and time, and in an unapolog unapologetic and and bold way. So this is me. I'm the director of the British Columbia Center of Excellence for Women's Health. I'm working on a range of things, virtual communities, uh, trauma-informed practice. Um, but today I'm going to um, focus on some of the work I've been doing with my colleagues at the center, um, looking at the area of gender transformative health promotion. Um, and we do have a website um, where you can go and um, read more about it, take a course about it, et cetera. But it's all linked to this book we published in 2014 called uh, Making It Better, Gender Transformative Health Promotion. 
Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about promising practices in girls' wellness programming and stop for questions and comments and then talk a bit more about it through um, inspirational resources that you can find online. And as uh, Simone said, um, please type in any questions or comments you have in the box on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And uh, I'll stop a couple of times to, um, to comment on them um, or uh, uh, respond to questions, et cetera. So the point of um, the presentation today is to explore a bit more about what we call gender transformative approaches, which actively strive to examine, question, and change gender norms and imbalance of power between men and women and boys and girls as a means of reaching health as well as gender equity objectives. So doing two things. Um, at once. So I'm go that's where I'm heading um, throughout this, but um, what I'm talking a lot about today um, is um, a scan we did of internet, on the internet, of program examples that are organized by the promising practices we found in this earlier study we did with the Girls Action Foundation. And many of the um, examples reflect the Girls Action Foundation approach, which, uh, which Simone uh, mentioned. So I'm going to organize this by these nine promising practices and then pull it up to talk a bit about gender transformative approaches and how they fit. So these were the nine promising practices, um, and this is a short version of it. I think that's on both Girls Action Foundation websites and uh, our website, a summary of that research project. And uh, I don't expect you to remember all these. We'll just go through them uh, one by one. So promising practices in girls' um, health and uh, health promotion, one of them is, um, and girls' groups more generally, is that they, they build skills. And um, here's an example of, um, of a program that, you know, fits that in terms of thinking about building violence prevention and assertiveness skills. And it is gendered um, in terms of uh, separating boys and girls and has been really widely, uh, widely used. Lots of programs um, work on the idea of promoting girls' physical activity, and um, this is one uh, example, and it also has a guide that looks at a range of other topics like alcohol and drugs and body image, et cetera. So lots of them uh, work in that area of skill building. Here's another area of skill building um, that's in, an interesting one oriented around um, skills around advocating, um, around um, campaigns and, um, and media literacy, et cetera, that's sponsored by the Ontario Lung Association. So we found a lot of things online that related to um, skill building uh, approaches, um, some of which are gendered specifically oriented towards girls and some more general like uh, this one. Now we were, we did find in our original research that it was a best practice to have girl only on gender based groups. Um, and we did find lots of those that were related to girls' health. Um, here's um, one that um, is um, connected to the United Nations Foundation um, that gives American girls the opportunity to raise awareness and funds for programs for girls in other countries. And health is one of the areas um, that are focused on um, in that. 
This is a fun one from um, the New England area called Bikes Not Bombs that uses the bicycle as a vehicle for social change. And the Girls in Action program combines bicycle mechanics and riding um, and getting, you know, getting active, um, connecting, going on field trips. Uh, doing doing community service, meeting other girls, et cetera, all through this process of uh, learning to um, build build a bike and and you can do mechanics around your bike. And here's another girls-oriented program um, that's an international one, um, combines activities based on HIV prevention and life skills and um, fair play soccer and peer-led community outreach activities. So we found lots of examples online of uh, girls-oriented uh, girls groups. And you can see that a lot of these examples combine more than one thing. These have skills, multi-component aspects, um, as well as girls only. The, one of the best practices we found um, in girls' groups and girls' health promotion was that they be girl-driven and um, participatory. Um, we didn't find as many girl-driven projects as in some of the other um, best practice areas. Here is one um, from the U.S. Um, a girl-driven um, project around media li uh, literacy and activism and um, art-oriented uh, projects. But lots of them were more oriented around, quotes youth um, that were really youth-led organizations. Um, and this one around drug policy reform and advocacy for harm reduction interventions for um, young people. And this one oriented around healthy living and um, eating well, gardening, food preservation, all, all range of environmentally oriented things for kids to, especially urban kids, to be able to connect to um, um, uh, the environment and um, healthy eating, et cetera. So not as many girl-driven programs online as, um, as we saw general uh, participatory uh, youth-led programs overall. Um, another best practice um, was related to enhancing social connections. And um, as, you know, that's sort of the bottom line, I think, in many ways for um, girls' uh, groups is connecting girls with other uh, girls as well as um, advocating for change. Here again, we found lots of um, general ones around um, after-school programs. Uh, such as this one focused on physical activity, nutritional support, and skill building in this after school period. Um, and here's another one related to food councils, um, engaging youth in food policy work um, through workshops and um, activism on local food policy issues. And here's an example from Australia that was we thought was just kind of an interesting one, which they called a national social inclusion program to help young people, again, not just girls, age 12 to 18, um, to um, get involved in um, uh, life skills and basketball activities, um, healthy living, alcohol and other drug use, financial issues, many other things um, are related. And it has a focus on um, culture as well and safety in terms of um, getting home uh, late at night. So lots of, uh, lots of aspects related to, um, to that one. Um, the best practices review also talked lots about um, 
self-esteem building um, as a core best practice. And there are many examples we found online, including this embodied love uh, movement to empower girls and women to value their inner beauty, to commit to kindness, and believe in their purpose. And that's an interesting website with lots of um, uh, work related to empowerment and action um, um, by girls and women. And uh, the Go Girls group um, uh, is a mentoring program for girls uh, 11 to 14. Many of you may be involved in uh, this particular one. Um, Again, oriented around positive self-image um, with weekly sessions, and it does include stuff around physical activity, healthy eating, self-esteem, and um, communication skills. So lots of um, good programming in, uh, on self-esteem. Here's another one from um, the, uh, the U.S. dedicated to um, uh, talking about healthy eating and disordered eating and um, really working on um, shifting the, the dialogue around uh, negative body image. You can see that many of these um, programs are multi-component, and that was one of the things we found when doing the literature search around best practice was that many of the most the programs creating the best outcomes for um, girls' health and wellness and uh, activism were really had were working from uh, multiple components, not just focusing on one thing at a time. When we looked online, we found various um, various examples of that. Here's an example of you know looking at physical activity and healthy eating and mental wellness um, together, and and social inclusion. And here's another example from the north of Canada that's looking at food, um, physical activity, health literacy, and culture and language in, um, in Nunavut. There were lots of programs that really did look at how to create culturally safe as well as girl-driven uh, and participatory and self-esteem oriented, et cetera. And this has been a big focus of um, Girls Action Foundation and, you know, it's also, I think, really borne out in the literature about the importance of making programs um, uh, culturally safe and uh, competent or whatever, agile, whatever uh, the words um, you feel most uh, comfortable with. And here's an example of one from New Mexico in, uh, in uh, the U.S. The Circle of Strength program is open to young women um, and they meet around four issues, um, change-making, skills-building, leadership, political education, and arts and expression, um, as well as um, being having programs oriented around pregnant and parenting teens, um, substance-using uh, girls, girls of color, a um, whole range of um, turning around that issue of um, over scrutiny of black girls with um, reproductive health, um, health issues. So really a folk bring, bringing a focus to, to culture, um, gender, and a range of health issues. Um, in the U.S. also, you know, the, or, there's definitely um, programs that orient around physical activity for girls of color, such as uh, Black Girls um, Run. 
And um, of course, in Canada, we have the great Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport and Physical Activity that has a whole range of services and programs and resources to support um, involvement in physical activity um, by uh, in a culturally safe uh, ways. So there's a range of things you can see here um, where they're really thinking through about how do we uh, do um, physical activity um, promotion with girls in a culturally uh, safe way. And the Another aspect found in the literature review around best practice is this idea of um, asset-based or strengths-based um, programming, and we found lots of examples um, around that where people are working not on um, sort of what's wrong with you, but more um, building on resilience and uh, strengths and a real positive focus such as um, this program around um, street, uh, street yoga. Um, we found street soccer um, programs as well, um, with this one um, happening in 41 countries, or engaging uh, women and um, providing women-only football uh, sessions, um, and for disadvantaged women uh, on the street uh, who've participated in the Homeless World Cup as a as a result of their involvement um, in this particular um, uh, programming of street soccer. Um, power play is another example in New York around um, where girls are offered the opportunity to learn a variety of sports and it has a health, wellness, and life skills curriculum that um, is connected to um, the girls' um, sports programming as well. And finally, the ninth area we found as really related to um, best practice in girls' empowerment groups were ones that were empowerment-oriented. And um, the Women Win internationally we found online um, is really oriented around sport, violence, reproductive health, economic empowerment, et cetera. An amazing um, multi-country program um, really uh, linking all of these things together. Um, the, this is another international movement um, related to um, body image um, and physical representation of women and girls in contemporary society. And um, they recently, this year, led the campaign to have I Feel Fat removed as a Facebook uh, category. And um, lots of work around um, empowerment by Indigenous youth groups. This one is an example of um, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network um, that um, supports Indigenous youth around empowering themselves um, with accurate shame and stigma-free information about the realities of HIV AIDS and a whole range of inter uh, interconnected issues. So really lots of work around um, empowerment. So just before I stop for questions, I wanted to introduce this idea of um, a gender transformative lens to this. And some of these programs you've seen, I think, have really are both working on health and striving to um, question and change gender norms and imbalance of power as a way of reaching their, uh, their goals around um, health promotion and um, girls' health. And, you know, in our book, we use this continuum of approaches to health, to action on gender and health, all the way from ones that really are gender blind or unequal through to ones that are more gender transformative and promoting gender equity. And I guess our thinking is that over time, more of the work that's been done has been around 
gender-sensitive programs and gender-specific programs, and not all of them are actually addressing the causes of health inequities at, the, at um, uh, and working to transform harmful roles and norms and practices. And uh, that's what we're hoping um, will happen in many of these um, these groups and projects oriented towards girls' wellness that the Girls' Action Foundation is embarking on. Here's an example of a great example of a, one that combines this idea of um, anti-violence work and gender equality. Um, in girls' separate um, and young men's separate um, programs, um, really working on a whole range of things. For the men, they're thinking a lot about caregiving and violence prevention. And for the young women, they're really working on gender inequities, rights, and health as they're, um, as they're creating programming, programming that um, tries to work on nonviolence and equality um, at the same time. And another example is True Child from the U.S., a wonderful uh, group that really targets gender norms as a way of improving um, uh, violence against uh, kids through cyberbullying and harassment, and really thinks about, um, you know, how important it is to be looking at gender norms, not simply um, giving skills around assertiveness. And they do the same thing on their website. They also talk about a programming program uh, for black girls' health and wellness that focuses on gender norms and tries to reframe the work around black girls as supposedly being, you know, culturally uh, having uh, meeting the cultural expectations of being emotionally strong superwomen and really tries to um, work on um, the, how those gender norms um, work, work against uh, girls' health in terms of girls coming for help or um, feeling able uh, to express that they're depressed or not emotionally strong in many ways. So, I'm going to stop here for um, and to answer any questions you have or um, get you to comment in the box about um, other examples that you know of that address these promising practices or in some way, you know, move towards really thinking about gender equity at the same time as we're working on wellness or health promotion. Yeah, I think there's one on uh, LGBTQ and youth in gender-based programs, and I think um, it's really, you'll notice the, um, the Promundo programs actually um, uh, offered three types of programs um, for young men, for young women, and um, a particular program um, promoting respect for sexual diversity, um, to reflect on questions and potential fears and prejudices related to homosexuality. So I think it's an important question for us to think about in terms of gender um, and um, creating the space for um, LGBTQ work within the context of um, of health promotion and gender transformative work. I know in British Columbia, the McCreary Society has really noticed that, um, you know, the, the girls most vulnerable um, in, in terms of heavy drinking actually are bisexual girls and really, you know, uh, calls upon us to question um, why that might be, and to create some understanding around um, that um, that sexual orientation. So I think it's a really um, a really important um, thing to to raise. And you know, I I 
pointed out here on this slide how they're doing gender synchronized groups. In other words, not groups um, for boys and girls together, but you know, boys and girls and men and women separately. And um, I think you know there are times when we may want to do um, uh, work together and work apart on um, on. Uh, homophobia and um, a positive um, sex sexual orientation and gender orientations um, as we go forth. So I think it's really an important one. And I see someone else here has um, noted that they work in a gender transformative group with guys. Um, and um, I'm just going to turn to um, the resources section in the second part of um, this presentation because I, I recognize there's so much um, that we need to, to be able to share amongst each other around gender transformative and, um, and other, um, other approaches. And I, you know, almost all of these, I'm going to sh show you where the Promundo uh, group uh, programming is listed online, and there's lots of um, material on the True Child site um, as well. So appreciate those questions. Now, Simone, have I missed anything else, or should is that all the questions? I'm uh, hi, Nancy. That looks like the questions for now. There's one question that just popped up, which we can address now or uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so um, let's look at that one. Do you know of any programs that take a gender concurrent program, separate boys and girls initially, then bring them back together? You know, um, I'm not sure about that, but I'm sure that that is a great approach. When I was in Australia recently, there was somebody who mentioned that they um, actually uh, do that, and I think you know, creating the opportunity for separate and together is a really important um, important part of the process. So that um, uh, that you know those learnings can be talked about together as well. So I think it's a great um, a great point, um, and uh, I'm sure it's happening in many places. Um, and we you know, but not necessarily profiled online. So it, maybe that's the next thing we need to do, uh, Simone, as we go forth, is to look for that um, kind of thing. But I think it gets to the point that is an extremely important one, is that we need to be working with girls, and we need to be working with boys, not girls only. Because um, if it's girls only, we leave the responsibility for this kind of change totally on girls' shoulders. Um, and I think we need to be thinking about um, both and, um, and what are gendered approaches that are needed in that context, and, uh, and then thinking about how, um, what, what is the magic in terms of bringing uh, girls and boys together. So um, lots, of, lots of food for thought there. Thank you. So I'm just going to go on, given the time, um, on to the second um, part of the presentation, and then we'll have another uh, uh, bit of time at the end um, to talk about it. And um, you know, it's interesting that one of the questions was on resources because we immediately, as we you know, were looking for best practices and programs, we also noticed there was a tremendous amount of material out there. Um, for use or adaptations by um, girls empowerment group uh, facilitators. And uh, so I just want to point out a few of the different kinds of things um, that are out there. Um, I just chose a couple of topics. We actually gathered way more than I'm going to show here today. Um, but in the area of mental wellness and um, health, we found um, lots of opportunities, um, online uh, materials, spaces, resources, et cetera, that were available to support um, uh, mental wellness. 
And um, we didn't we didn't find a lot of them that were girl specific. Um, and this this one um, isn't, um, but is a space to find support when going through uh, tough times um, online. This uh, girls talk program is girl specific from CAMH. Um, it's an eight session um, dep depression prevention program for girls. And um, a really um, interesting um, um, program really considering the you know like the true child folks were thinking about is a space for girls to um, connect and share with each other um, around um, uh, not going uh, uh, down the depression uh, route but being able to talk about depression um, Healthy Minds and Healthy in Active Bodies is um, something that's been promoted by CAUSE, whom I spoke about uh, before, and some of you um, may be connected to, but they do have a fact sheet on promoting mental health amongst girls and uh, young women. So trying to make connection between um, um, physical activity, which we know is um, a really important part of uh, mental wellness. Um, as well. And here's a website, Mindfulness for Teens, um, that has uh, lots of resources on it um, uh, from, um, from BC, um, teaching, teaching mindfulness and having resources around that. Um, the mindcheck.ca um, uh, is oriented around those who are 13 to 25 years old, a website where you can check out how you're feeling and get connected to support early and quickly. So there's lots of materials, um, uh, screening tools, and um, various self-help um, connections. And here's one that's oriented um, around um, Aboriginal young people. Um, as that's a suicide prevention um, online um, resource. So lots of um, lots of possibilities in terms of um, what we can find that supports um, wellness um, that may be um, a resource for um, girls uh, group facilitators. Um, in the area of violence prevention, we found um, lots of ideas as well, including the toolkit from uh, the Promundo group um, that really is oriented around gender transformative work. It looks at identity and power, um, uh, sexual and uh, reproductive health rights, caregiving, violence prevention, Etc. So really trying to um, be a toolkit on a range of issues at once and promoting that idea of linking those things. Um, lots of apps um, related to um, violence prevention like the Circle of Six app here. Um, lots of resources around healthy dating attitudes and relationships um, such as this um, love is respect um, site. Um, here's another one that's oriented around uh, feminists of color working to end violence against women and um, trans people of color and their communities, et cetera. So really promoting this idea of both direct action but also critical dialogue and um, looking at uh, gender norms, practices, relations, and orientations in, um, in the context of ending violence. And um, here's a very practical piece on, on, uh, around health in terms of being able to remove sexualized pictures um, and stop others uh, sharing, uh, sharing that con uh, content. And here's another example of an app like that around I Decide um, that puts you in charge of your incoming uh, calls and texts, et cetera. 
And um, from that group I mentioned earlier, the Project Girl, there's a workbook um, on unmediifying your life um, where that helps girls critically consider the effects of um, media on their life. And um, here's an example from New Zealand uh, toolkit um, that educates young people about the prevention of sexual violence and ethical sexual um, decision making. And um, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting about this one is that it gives, you know, a scenario, it gives scenario video clips that um, show um, a case of uh, sexual violence um, in in a bar and the role of um, the the girl's girlfriend, the um, a man in the bar, and um, the bartender, and shows how the whole scene might transpire in one direction, and then shows it again in terms of people. Um, actually being bystander or upstanders in terms of intervening and support. It's just kind of interesting to me because it really includes girlfriends as uh, bystanders, not only um, boys and men uh, in traditional gender heroic ways in being, um, in being uh, good, good bystanders. Um, and this one I included um, because it's a wonderful, there's a wonderful video clip on the Our Watch website about uh, uh, gender equality as being an important part of prevention of violence against women. I really encourage you to see it. It's a story about showing how these various gender drivers um, are underlying violence against women and how important it is for us to work in uh, in, in gender transformative ways if we are to prevent violence against women and girls. So lots of ideas around um, resources um, and possibilities for moving to um, a bit more of a gender transformative way of um, uh, supporting girls within uh, girls groups. Um, in the area of sexual and reproductive health, there's lots of um, online uh, supports for us in terms of um, promoting health um, in, from, from various, uh, various locations, including the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, um, including the Centers for Disease Control, including um, the Best Start Resource Center that um, has put together this prenatal health um, uh, resource for Aboriginal uh, teens. And, uh, you know, also another example from Australia. You can tell I've been to Australia recently, got lots of examples um, from there. Um, again, uh, health promotion resources specifically for Indigenous youth, um, very community-oriented um, approach. Um, and our own um, folks in uh, Canada, the SOGC, has um, lots of videos and um, support on their sexuality and you, um, their various apps and the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health as well has lots of um, resources to support um, sexual health, as does Alberta Health uh, Services, with lots of tools and online um, oppor opportunities. And in Vancouver, um, um, YouthCo has created um, a guidebook to train youth peer facilitators on how to hold space for workshops about sexual health and harm reduction um, with other young people. So a peer-driven uh, um, sexual health um, resource. But I wanted to end um, with this um, particular one um, that um, is an example from Ontario that is kind of moving past this idea that we need to 
provide information and support around relational skills, um, et cetera, to really doing gender critique while we're, while we're doing health promotion. And this is just one example I found on the 4R um, website. Um, which is an example of a school-based presentation and discussion that they foster called um, Coming of Age in the Digital Era. And um, they look at representations of males and females in the media and address what these images say about gender stereotypes and normative masculinity and femininity. And the topics discussed include, you know, the kind of mixed media messages that are out there, the violence in the media, the hypersexualization of girls, and interestingly, I think, how social media is impacting on youth perceptions of what type of person they're supposed to be. So I think this is an example of kind of pulling, you know, what we have as resources to support gender transformative work um, up to this idea of really thinking about how are we supporting this kind of critical thinking about gender, even as we're um, using these online resources on, uh, on health promotion. So, lots of resources to support girls' empowerment programming. Um, and how, you know, some questions I have, I guess, around at this point are how do we support programs to stay abreast of resources and to really move to that, you know, next frontier of doing health promotion and promoting gender equity at the same time. So, Simone, I'll ask you to jump back in for a minute here um, to um, yeah. look at any questions that have come up. Absolutely. There is quite an active Q&A chat. Um, I'll start with a really interesting question here um, to see what you would say. It would be interesting to hear your response. Uh, is it safe to say that any health promotion is ineffective without a gender transformative approach? What would you say to that, Nancy? I would say no, that it's not um, – I'm not saying that um, programs are ineffective because, you know, they may well promote health. But I guess I just kind of feel that we may be in the same place 20 years from now trying to make nice programs on, for self-esteem and skills and whatever for girls. Um, if we don't think also about changing these fundamental things at the same time, which are, you know, those larger gender relations and um, norms uh, that don't serve um, girls well overall. So I guess I'm just saying I think this is opening up the opportunity for us to really be activists on a fundamental level at the same time as we're doing health promotion. So I think you can do health promotion and you can have some benefits for girls for sure, but um, ultimately I think doing two things at once takes us ahead farther so that we're not in essence kind of band-aiding. Um, forever and always having to be worried about girls' uh, self-esteem and body image and depression and all these things that, you know, have a uh, connection to gender inequity. So I guess that's <laughs> – I'm just saying I think this is a better way. It's not the only way that it achieves uh, good outcomes, but, um, but it's definitely um, – promising, I think, to taking us to another level. Yes, thank you. And you, you shared a variety of programs there that give very interesting examples uh, that each have their own strengths that we can all take inspiration from in our programming. 
Um, mm. We have another another question here, also about the notion of transformative programs, programs for girls, programs for boys. Um, so the question posed here is, um, do you think it's valuable to address gender inequality uh, in mixed groups, um, not just girls' groups or guys' groups or programs for LGBTQ um, youth? Um, to the to the aim of what you're speaking to of you know how do we ever reach a mutual appreciation? Um, do you have any yeah. insights around the strengths of having programming uh, where groups are together and or separate? Yeah, and I think both both and are really important. You know, and I think the one I, example I showed from the fourth R is not gender specific. It's general school based presentations um, that invite those, um, those discussions um, at the level of um, in mixed groups as far as I know. You know, it's hard to read from the websites so all the things that are right. going on, right? But I do think it's important to have both and I just think that um, perhaps especially for teens, but definitely um, for everyone, that because of the way gender norms and relations um, operate, that it's that it's difficult for boys and men to really have the opportunity to examine. Um, vulnerability, um, caregiving, all the things that aren't necessarily associated with traditional male norms. Um, and, and likewise for girls and women to be able to um, examine rights and empowerment and assertiveness, et cetera, that are not necessarily traditional gender uh, norms for girls in mixed groups if you know if they're if they haven't had previous you know separate possibilities of of examining uh, these things to um separately and really thinking it through um together um i think it's harder to really move forward on gender equity within the mixed groups unless the other pieces are done as well. So I think it's definitely possible. It's necessary in the long run, but I also really see the benefits of us um, working in gendered ways um, as well as in, you know, collective ways. We don't have enough examples of, you know, where it's been done and, um, you know, with, um, with um, uh, you know, good evaluations as, as we might. Um, I think the Promundo groups and others are really good examples of um, where they have very stringently evaluated the gender synchronized approach as the um, as a really important way forward. Yes, that frames it really well, and, and uh, it's evident that you offer presented a framework that presents important questions and points to opportunities where identity and activities intersect. And uh, just as a result, in our comments here, there's a lot of exchange among participants with different program examples. Um, so um, I'll just do a call out for those of you who are still there. If there's any additional questions um, that you'd like to offer to Nancy while we're talking about um, health promotion and gender transformative approaches to programming with youth. Um, so we'll just take a moment to see if there are any questions before we wrap up the webinar. Lots of ideas here, right, eh, about um, programs that are working in uh, with trans youth as well, which is really uh, great to hear. And um, yeah, and uh, lots of great examples. This is going to be nice to have um, on, on record. Um, I'll just move along here uh, to do a quick summary um, about um, uh, 
one last slide to just you know, wrap it up in some ways. To me, it feels like there's really a wide range of program, pro programming available, and most programs that we saw online and that we reviewed um, from the academic literature um, meet approximately three of the <laughs> promising practices. So lots of great work going on in terms of promising practices in uh, girls' health promotion or girls wellness, whatever uh, term we want to use. And there's also really a lot of resources available. Like we just could not believe the amount of materials that are available to support um, the facilitators. But also a real challenge, I think, for facilitators to um, have these um, at their fingertips. and. Um, so, you know, really um, glad there's programs like the Girls Action Foundation to help coordinate uh, or networks um, to help coordinate and, and support this kind of um, work by girls groups, uh, girls group facilitators. And, you know, that my last point that I've been weaving through here is just I think we have the further challenge at this point is not only to do these promising practices and, and combining them, um, not only to use the many resources that are available to us, but also to be thinking about how we're promoting gender equity, um, not only sort of accommodating girls' needs, but moving along that framework that I showed you to really to the end um, that's more about trans transformative um, approaches. So thanks a lot um, to you, Simone, for bringing me in to share all this work we've been doing um, for the Girls Action Foundation. Yes, thank you to you too, Nancy. It's mutual and it's um, an exciting project for Girls Action and there's much more to come um, tied to this project. Um, so uh, to conclude, thank you very much, Nancy, for that wonderful presentation and everybody's participation uh, during it. Uh, but that's all the time we have for today. Uh, for those who would like to share this webinar with others, a link to the full presentation and the question period will be available online in the next few days. And uh, we'll be sending you a link on where to find it. Uh, we would also like to thank you for your feedback. Um, we would like to ask you for your feedback on today's presentation. Once you leave this webinar, a window will appear with a very short survey. We would really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. Uh, this is a way for us to continue to improve the webinar experience for participants. And uh, to find out more about this topic, um, check out our publications in our online resource center on our website. We have two here uh, that were created in partnership with the BC Center of Excellence for Women's Health. And also, you can visit our website, uh, girlsactionfoundation.ca. Uh, you can view past webinars. Uh, you can like our Facebook page, as well as follow us on Twitter um, at at underscore girls action. And you can find more about upcoming webinars by going to the Girls Action website at girlsactionfoundation.ca webinars. And again, thank you for attending. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, thank you in advance for filling out the survey. Um, have a great day, everyone. Okay, bye.